it's Q and time. Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, this video will be the huge Q&A that has been requested and um, I will be making this kind of video every month since this is what most of you um, uh, felt like this was going to be the best frequency. So um, I'm going to do one big Q&A monthly and I will always um, let you know where and when to ask your question for uh, in order for me to answer them so uh, thank you so much to everyone uh, normally i do i had in mind to do a q a to celebrate every uh, milestone so i did a, a thousand subscriber two thousand subscriber and then um, i had a huge boost from uh, natural hypertrophy and uh, coach Boldo Bliman, also alan trial who helped me I gained a lot of visibility, so a lot of you are actually very new here. Welcome and thank you for subscribing and watching my video. So we did the 3,000, 4,000, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we are even short to 8,600 subs right now. So <laughs> it all happened very fast and um, I'm not used to this kind of uh, uh, growth speed, but uh, I'm very glad for it. It's a huge boost and I'm very blessed for it. So. Moving on, let's go with the Q&A. So I did two community posts to let people uh, ask their question and uh, I will basically answer them right now. Um, I also want to uh, apologize for the, um, the recent absence. I've had some personal stuff to attend to and I was a bit sick. And maybe you can hear it still, I hope not. But um, yeah, let's go. Bilabin ask, congrats on your recent success. Thank you, bro. Very well deserved, thank you bro. Question for your Q&A. How did you come to find out that you do best with a three-day full body split? Your split is far from what is conventional in the hypertrophy world, so I'm interested to hear your process of experimentation with training and the thought process that led to the decision. Um, oh, there is a comment. Oh. Okay, so, uh, thank you for your question. Um, well, three days full body split is something that I did for years about four years and then um, 2020 happened um, and during 2020 with the for a few months i was forced to do a double push push leg uh, or triple upper lower i think i'll turn it because i had some issues but whatever um, then i got back to full body then i went back to france so yeah basically i did three days week weekly of full body for about five years in a row and um, it's it's quite simple before that prior to that I had done a lot of uh, different kind of split uh, during my first year of training I did the bro split I did push pull leg um, I did full body two three days a week uh, I did upper lower I did a uh, double push pull leg, uh, then during my second year I did mostly upper lower, double upper lower. Uh, then I did um, golden era split uh, and so on and so forth. And basically three days a, a week of full body uh, for most of you and for me for a very long time was the best equation and the best balance between me going to the gym, training hard and me getting back home and recovering. Uh, it is also one of the most uh, supple and flexible way of training because if you miss a training for whatever reason, you know, like there is some commute transportation problem or you have some personal emergency or you're sick, you miss a training, but it's fine because two days after, at the latest, you can go back to the gym and just resume where you went. So it is one of the best way to actually train your whole body three times per week and even if something arrives, at least twice a week, um, which is for natural, one of the, like the sweet spot, like you could overthink on many things, but you know, just train every muscle twice a week and you'll be good, you know? And if you have a recovery capacity and the time and inside your schedule to go train um, every muscle thrice a week, well, go for it, you know? Uh, but right now I'm not uh, doing a three day full body split anymore. Uh, I'm doing a double half body, and a full body rotation so I like my program rotate every 10 days so I do upper lower upper lower full body and so five days of training and I take a rest 
a day of rest in between or two. So yeah, every 10 to 11 days I have this kind of rotation. But for most of most people, when you're not freakishly strong or when you do not want to have a lot of exercise in your training, I think three times per week body, uh, full body is uh, like the best. Like <laughs> there is some inconvenient, but they are really outperformed by every quality that you have in that kind of speed. So there you go. Okay, Joe, <laughs> Joe Mama. <laughs> Hey bro, I discovered your channel from A&H, I definitely, definitely good find and I got a question for you, Q&A. I've got my buddy in the gym, but he keeps going through period where he skips a week or two and I don't know how to get him to stay consistent because I've never struggled with that. I've always loved training since day one. I think I've, I think I've had one week off in my five year training. How do I keep him in the gym weeks after week? Really hoping you can help me out. He has great genetic and it'd be a shame to see them go to waste, especially because I know he wants to look great. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I, I have had, um, I've been in your shoes many times and the truth is you can force him. The guy wants to look great. He has access to a gym. He has access to a great body to train with, which is rare, which is you. And he still skips a week here, a week there, and he wants to look great and he has great genetic, I mean, it, it's discipline, you know, like, uh, if I went into your shoes, I would slap him and I would say, look, you want to look great, you have good genetic, just fucking commit to it for like three months and then maybe, you know, um, skip here and there and just maintain with two, two trainings a week. If he really has great genetic, he will maintain no problem with just two trainings a week, like half body or full body, whatever. And that's it. But if he can't make this commitment, well... Um, it's pure laziness because there is literally no excuse. It's not like he was a hard gainer or a bad genetic. And also, um, as a friend, I don't think you can trust him because he can literally not commit to one thing where you are literally chewing and putting yourself the food inside his mouth. So uh, I have no, no real um, advice for you. I've been in your shoes many times, and each time um, I'm telling them the same. You know, I had a guy, for example, that I had been training for six or seven years, and the guy, um, in eight months, he, was, he had basically my shape. And I was like, okay, in eight months you did that shape? Okay, bro, you need to do this, you need to do that, take care of this, take care of that. Uh, let's go and do that. Two weeks after I quit the gym. And he comes back four months after and he resumes back and in like two weeks he's back to his previous shape again and uh, he doesn't want to commit, you know, some, uh, sometimes it do be, you know, so don't waste time with that, focus on yourself, bro. Okay, Ben CG, Jay, I would like to know what are your thoughts on using a chest expander in training the upper back shoulder and overall yoke muscle? Uh, well, my thought is that I never tried it, but uh, painful, bend, bend pull apart, sorry, uh, is a fantastic way to strengthen the whole upper back. So if with chest expander you have the same kind of thing but with an even higher potential of resistance, it's gonna work. And plus Alexander Leonidas is a prime example that it can work. So it's good, I just never tried it yet. Um, okay, Lucas won. Hi, Sobiak. In your experience, what are the differences between standing barbell and double OHP, the stability? Which one do you prefer, barbell, and which one is more important for a beginner to focus, barbell? The standing OHP is my main pressing movement. Thank you. Well, barbell. Um, Gulaz. Congrats on the growth. Thank you, bro. I sent you a question on your ring work q and A. I I'm also curious about your thoughts on zero and that pull up and doing them weighted. Um, so I will resume to your ring work with the, when I'm done with this uh, community post. But the, regarding zero and that pull up and doing them weighted, um, so for people that do not know, zero and that pull up is basically a sternum pull up that you do at body weight. But you're, you're basically not even aiming for your abs, it's like you really want to pull backward, like you're, you're trying to get up and see what's happening behind you at the same time. So um, it's a great lat movement, 
it is a great upper back movement. Uh, but the huge problem is the balance, the accumulated fatigue that you will have while balancing out your lower body. And also doing them weighted is very tricky because um, when you are vertical, the weight is uh, between your legs, okay? You go up. If you're going pretty much straight, the, the weight will still be under you. It will be, still be very close to the center of gravity and the pull line, right? But if you go with a sternum pull down, uh, pull up, sorry, you're not pulling up, you're pulling up and back like that, in this kind of motion, like a J, like this. But the weight is still pretty low between your legs. So when you're vertical, it will be dead, and when you are trying to get horizontal, it will be dead. So you will try, you will create some kind of weird momentum, like a, like a balance thing like that, and um, you will have to resist it with your core muscle to not lose the position and the, uh, the groove of the movement. And um, yeah, um, I've tried it and the max I could do was one plate and then it's just playing catch up and balance with the weight between the legs. So uh, maybe with a, a weighted vest, it could be good, but with a um, traditional you know, chain with a, a plate or dumbbell between your legs, not gonna, not gonna work. This is the kind of movement you should go for a lot of sets and you basically work with uh, the rest period, you know, like you're doing 10 sets of body weight and uh, you try to do, let's just say, 10 by 10, for example, and you're, uh, you're resting, I don't know, one minute and a half, <coughs> sorry, one minute and a half between sets. And when you can do this 10 by 10 with mon uh, 90 seconds of rest between sets, well, you cut it to 80 and then to 70, and then to 60, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not the kind of exercise you can just add weight, add weight, add weight, add weight, and reap the same uh, reward, basically. So there you go. Um, next question. Okay, Popcorn2. In your day of fitting video, you talk about how your diet, diet is specifically tailored to your own needs from a genetic and digestive standpoint. My question is, how did you test, experiment for that? I've recently realized that dairy hurt my digestive system, but I'm out of ideas to how to get protein as convenient as dairy. I am a university student, so unfortunately I cannot afford to, both because of money and time, be cooking steaks, chicken, fish every day or twice a day in order to get uh, a thousand, uh, 150 plus gram of protein per day. Um, okay, thank you for your question. Nicola Alexic. Um, answer and say try eggs, takes two minutes to cook in a pan, tend to boil or can even drink raw or may make shake with blended fruits. That's actually a great suggestion. So thank you Nicola for, for sharing. Um, okay, so how did, that, how did I test or experiment for that uh, in, uh, regarding my diet? Well, it's quite simple. I am, so I'm born and raised in France, but my genetic roots are from Portugal um, Sardinia, so Italia if you prefer, and um, I have some weird stuff happening with like uh, Austria, Germ uh, Germany, uh, and also Ireland. So, if you go back in time, okay, and you look at what your grandparents or great-great-grandparents or great-great-great-great-grandparents were eating, what were they eating? In the case of Portugal people, um, it's quite simple, they were eating uh, a lot of fruits and veggies, a lot of um, cereal, especially wheat. They were eating a lot of little fishes, chicken, some pork, eggs, olive oil, um, and some nuts and seeds. Red meat was pretty rare, and um, dairies was mostly from um, cheese and butter not much milk per se, even if of course they were uh, drinking milk. But even still, we're not talking exclusively about cow milk, but also from goat milk, all right? When these people make babies, it's not about just making babies, it's about transmitting your gene, your gene pool. So in your gene pool, there is everything that has been literally naturally selected to being passed on because it is how you thrive and survive. So. All these people that made babies and then made babies and then made babies, you come to me. I have the genes to 
withstand without any problem and absorb and assimilate without problem little fishes, chicken, eggs, fruit, veggies, and so on and so forth, right? You don't see many people that are from Mediterranean um, uh, forefathers being gluten intolerant. Most of the time it's not the gluten that is the problem, it's how the wheat of the cereal is processed, right? And you do not see many German and Scandinavian people that are dairies or lactose intolerant. Why? Because their forefathers were literally um, eating only meat, potatoes and dairies. Hmm? So that's how I did it. It's basically testing and experimenting, of course. I, I ate a lot of uh, food across my life, you know, different food. And um, it's all about experimenting. For example, peanut butter. Uh, I like peanut butter, you know. Um, but each time I would eat some, I would get some spots on my face. I would ha have a lot of uh, sebum production on my face too, especially the forehead and the, and the nose. And I would have this weird feeling of having something clogging my uh, my throat, right? It's not just I did not swallow it properly because I would drink water or something after and it would still stay. And so basically I had the same feeling in my guts. So peanut butter for me is tasty on, on the phone, no problem. But the quantity I was eating or the frequency I was eating made me at some point be like, um, I know I'm going to suffer from from taking that spoon, so I'm not going to do it. And um, and yeah, that's basically what I do. Even when I'm training people, I'm like, okay, uh, I see your family name. You must be from this kind of accent, right? And I'm like, okay, what are you eating? So I ask for like a, a plan of what they are eating usually. And I see, for example, people, I'm going to give you one example. One guy from Germany with from German accent from, you know, a while. He was uh, doing keto and he was eating a lot of veggies. Well, guess what? He was feeling like trash and he was bloated. And I said, okay, let's get back on the veggies, uh, add back some potatoes. We are going to stop for the, uh, that keto thing for a while and we are going to increase meat consumption and stop with the fish because he was eating a lot of big fish like tuna and salmon. Um, and boom, immediately a lot of pimple on the skin uh, deflating at the same time, feeling way better on that kind of diet. Um, and uh, in like two months, he was feeling great and he shaved off a lot of fat or body weight. We did not even know where it came from because he wasn't that fat at the first time. But what happened? I just used a different diet that was more uh, adaptable to his genes, basically. Of course, you have a, a range of a margin, you know, because of course your gut flora is alive, so depending on what you're eating and not eating, the gut flora will adapt, but there is there is some overlaps that you cannot cross, you know. Um, I challenge anyone to eat like a Maasai guy, you know, it's like a tribe in Africa, they are eating, they are only drinking milk from cow and drinking their blood, and very rarely uh, some other stuff. Show me how healthy you're gonna be by doing that. I dare you. And also, we could call, we could talk about the Denisovian tribe, uh, southeast of Asia. These people only eat fish, fish and seafood. That's it. Try it. See how you feel. Not for weeks, for months, even for years. Something wrong is going to happen because you're not made to do that. I personally love seafood, but not every seafood, and just eating it once in a while, like I don't know, twice in a month max, I'm good. You know, so. You just have to to go with that, and um, and um, yeah, uh, I have another example if you want. Uh, it is about people from North Africa that immigrate in Europe. So in North Africa, you can check what they are were normally eating for eons. They go in Europe. They all fall sick. They all get diabetes. They all get some metabolic syndrome. They all feel weird and sick, and they have some problem with their high side, with their skin, they balloon up, you know, I'm not talking all of them of course, but uh, it happens a lot. They also get some arthrosis problem, like their, their joint flare up, and they don't understand why. Well, it's simple, they're not eating how their ancestors were eating, and they're eating way too much also. So, you know, all of that, you have like genetic studies, you know, you can, you can you can uh, Google it for yourself, you can check it out, but um, 
like the gene stuff regarding your diet is very real and I just adapted mine to, to it, you know. If I can eat 12 eggs a day, it's because I can eat 12 eggs a day. I have no problem doing that. Sometimes I will just eat 6 or 10 because I'm like, hey, you know what, I don't want to... Uh, Sometimes I will eat no eggs at all and I will eat uh, close to a kilo of, uh, of meat in a day. But it's once in a while. I cannot eat one kilo of meat every day. I cannot. It's funny, but I cannot. So just, you know, use your logic and common sense. Okay, next question. Domien Balegir, I'm sorry if I butcher your name. So you eat bread and cheese often, every day, mostly every day. It is remarkable the ends guy hits so different team from the natural lifting guy from time to time. Chicken and rice. Yeah, well, but I think that ends people can get by with very low fat diet because fat are the building blocks for your hormones. And if you're injecting something, you do not need much, that much fat. And actually, since these people are much more prone to like having cholesterol, hypertension and other um, issues in that range, you know, high fat can actually uh, be even more harmful for them because too much fat in your diet can actually get you these kind of issues, these kind of metabolic issues. So I guess that's why. I guess that's why. Okay. Oh, we are done for this one. Okay. Next question. Online study alarms. Is training for strength possible while training for hypertrophy? Yes. Something like training three days full body for hypertrophy and one day strength and plyometrics. What's the link between plyometrics and strength, please? Would like to hear your opinion on training, on the train, training style like this and if it's worthwhile or possible at all. No, it's not. First and foremost, full body can make you train your strength. It's not just merely for hypertrophy. And second, you will have to explain to me what plyometrics are doing here. Because plyometrics are for speed strength, not power. Power is strength and speed uh, multiplied. Um, plyometrics is for is speed strength, not strength speed. So I, I don't understand the, the need for it. Um, it's not like you're trying to train for something athletic. And strength is uh, joint angle and movement specific. Meaning that you can have someone who is very, very strong on a few specific movements, like a power lifter, for example, but who isn't that strong or even weak on other movement because it's so, he's so specialized on this specific motor pattern. So... I mean, if you go with strength and hypertrophy in your body, you're, you're doing something with called power building, which is what a lot of bodybuilders who are very successful and high, um, Olympic weightlifters are doing. You see many high-level uh, Olympic weightlifters who can, uh, of course, snatch and clean and jerk a lot. And their back squat is humongous, their front squat is humongous, their deadlift is humongous. Uh, their um, power clean, power snatch are also very, very good, but also their overhead press, their push press, their bench press, uh, close grip bench, dips, pull up, all of these are very, very strong overall, even if, of course, there are some movements that are <laughs> maxed out and some over, but they are just running as assistants. So, uh, yeah, but you do not need the strength and plyometric um, day, especially when you're already doing three days full body, because if you do the three days full body well, you will want to rest, not do some plyometric stuff. So yeah. Stephen Thomas, I have a pretty big lat imbalance. Can you recommend any unilateral lat exercise that don't use machine or cable? Dumbbell row. I'm here from natural hypertrophy. Great that he's shining a light on a smaller content creator. Yes, indeed, I'm very blessed. And as I said, dumbbell row will be your best friend. And you just make sure to have a, a flanked elbow to keep the elbow closed and you make sure to focus on the elbow adduction, not the scapular retraction. The lat does not attach with the shoulder blade, so you do not necessarily need to move them. And also, uh, pullover, bottom-up pullover, like you're doing pullover, you, do, you go on a flat, uh, decline bench is of course better, but even flat is okay, and you just do the um, first half of the, of the, the movement. Okay, heel feeding. 368 ask should novice early and late use fat grips 
and do direct rear delt and forearm isolation. Uh, you can watch my beginner training vid and you will have all your answers except for the fat grips. Uh, you do what you want to do, but if you do not have any sport specific uh, goals that involve fat grip, like um, I don't know, hand wrestling, all the stuff, I don't see the real point in a bodybuilding context again. Okay. Benjamin Lizama asks, which book do you recommend for hypertrophy training? Uh, I'm going to make a video about that to explain everything, but basically every book that uh, Frédéric Delavier and Michael Degendil wrote. So, you know what, I'm going to even show them to you. Supplement guide for athletes. Strength training movement, anatomy book. Arm training book. Everything for your arms, forearm, and to not uh, wreck your shoulder, elbow, joint. Um, strength training anatomy workout book. This is the third. This is for very advanced lifter. Second, which is uh, the best one basically for everyone. Um, and I have the first one somewhere else. But yeah, basically all these books, you know, you buy them all. It will be like 300 bucks or something. And you will, you read them, you learn them, you know, by heart, like 100% and you will be better than most personal trainer and sport professional and you can mark my word for that um, and also you will be more knowledgeable about, uh, than most um, American biomechanic expert and I'm, I uh, emphasize the American because most American biomechanic expert uh, no, they, they are not expert okay? and if you, they can make like pretty Instagram on, you know, videos, posts but when you look at what they are saying and then what they apply, you know, there is a, there is a gray area in the between, you know, and uh, you, you, I don't know what happened there, but yeah, they do not know. So I, I have links in my description, like Amazon shop list. You can find them all uh, in different languages uh, because it's like it's best selling books in like the entire world. And um, yeah, have fun. All right, Mr. Chris MK, which one and why are better for natural bodybuilding, high intensity or high volume? Most of coaches used for natural high intensity and low volume, I saw you are using mostly high volume. Explain this, please. Well, explain to me how you determine that I'm using mostly high volume, because I'm not. What you saw was me using free weights, I'm pretty sure you came from NH, uh, it, he, he, he reviewed one of the training I did years ago in a trash gym where I could not use any machine so I was forced to use free weight. Um, I dare any one of you to do high intensity low volume on free weight, so basically going to failure with dumbbell and barbell and even cables, even if cables are of course way tougher, to go to failure and to not wreck your joints after a few weeks of training that way. You cannot. Hence why I was doing a lot of 5x5, five five, a lot of 6x4, uh, and so on and so forth, and 5x10 with, with, with like short rest. And most of coaches, I would like you to show me these coaches that are doing high intensity and low volume for natural mostly and exclusively. Because I can at least, uh, from pure head, I can at least quote and give you names of 10 pro athletes that are obviously using gears that are doing high intensity and low volume. And furthermore, um, there is something called um, neurotip, um, which is basically how your nervous system is working. And some people are primed to do high intensity, low volume because they can recruit all the motor units. It's genetic, it's because of their sport practice, it is also because they train for it that they, they literally optimized and made everything um, in their sport practice to become more efficient as, as to send a huge hertz wave with the nerves and some people um, are not primed for that and other people cannot train like that so what's better for natural bodybuilding? well what's better <laughs> it's what you can sustain in your context and what is making you have a convenient and a solid training plan that you can follow consistently. Because if you have great genes, you can do whatever, whatever you want. It will work. Whatever. 
And if you have bad genes, you can do whatever you want. You can optimize this as much as you want. You will have to grind out every little ounce of muscle that you want to earn. So, in the end, it's not that it's really uh, unimportant, but you will see for yourself very quickly what is working and what isn't working. So, yeah. And I'm not using high volume. At least I hope. I don't think so. Quillen Iriel. Question 1. What is your opinion on doing lateral raises before barbell OHP? Depends on the context. Or the context. I'm not doing them behind the neck. In training session, if side delt, side delt are lagging. Anything else I can do to increase the frequency and volume? Second to question. Your tips to break strength pedal if diet and sleep are not the issue. Uh, for the second question, if diet and sleep are not the issue, and they mostly are, but let's just say you're right, it's your training plan who is not okay. And as for the first question, why are you asking me about frequency and volume and not about, well, what kind of strength um, PR I should uh, unlock to have bigger side delt? Because side delt, just like any muscle, we grow with mechanical tension. So, of course, the shoulder joint um, is fragile, we need to take care of, of them, but I have seen no one lacking side delt when they can uh, overhead press two plates and rep it for volume, whatever the variation, if it's behind, in front, standing, seated, high incline, whatever. Um, you know, ju just train them, just train your side delt and fix your form because if they are lagging, it also means that you cannot recruit them efficiently. It will make me most likely you have like uh, overpowering arms and traps, I guess. So it's just about doing them properly. I would uh, recommend cable and um, being patient, you know. So that's all there is to it. And even if there was more, I'm sorry, I, d I have no, no context here, so I can't really answer your question. Like uh, 100%. LOTW fan one asks how to mix strength training and martial art with demanding job, and at 30 plus years of age. Uh, depend what martial art it is. Depend what are your goals with tra strength training. But I would say two training sessions of gym in the week and one to two martial arts sessions in the week. So you would, you would train either half body or full body, and uh, you would then train your martial art. And if we were able to optimize that, as, uh, optimize that as much as possible, you would do the strength training the day prior the martial art, and not the reverse. Not martial art and strength training. And also try to not do them on the same day, okay? Like, do not do strength training in the morning and then at night the martial art, you, you will not, um, um, it, won't, it won't go well. And as for the demanding job, well, you need to really make sure to have dialed sleep and um, um, use supplement also to boost recovery, so uh, joint support, glucosamine, chondroitin, collagen, glycine, um, vitamin D3, K2, Selenium, zinc, magnesium, basically uh, everything that can support your endocrine um, and joint system while keeping your guts healthy. Uh, Lee Pretorius asks, where did you get that jersey? Uh, I got it in Ireland in uh, a shop. There were two nice ladies and uh, it's, made in, um, it's made in Ireland with Irish wool. So, yeah. It's very, very nice. Thank you. Joel Krigskowski. Sorry. What was your biggest plateau and how did you get past it? My biggest plateau. I think my biggest plateau was four plate deadlift from the floor. This stuff intimidated me for years. And I would do any kind of training uh, style, you know, I did the 5x3, uh, I did cube, um, I did the west side barbell stuff and it never worked. The barbell would intimidate me. And so, how did I get past it? I stopped doing conventional deadlift because I was most likely burned from it and I was not cycling with um, 
uh, variations that would allow my lower back to rest. I was do doing a lot of deficit deadlift. I was doing snatch grip, deficit, snatch grip from the floor, uh, snatch grip RDL. And um, I think my lower back was just right. And I would, did not have much training e equipment available. It was my previous old gym, home gym at my dad's place. So I was kind of stuck, you know. And then I got back into uh, a gym. And I was like, I, you know, I don't want to deadlift anymore. I'm just going to train with like my snatch grip stuff and I will be happy uh, and my lower back is killing me. I'm going to do front squat and, you know. And then one day I'm like, oh, you know what? Let's just try it. And I ramp up uh, in a semi-sumo style um, and the foreplay just went up like that. It just went up, you know, and it was pretty easy. And that same day, I loaded up to um, uh, 190 kilo, uh, and um, again, I did it, you know, and I did not try for years to go higher than that, um, and so I do not know how much I can deadlift from the floor, I just know that 2,000 kilo, uh, 2,000, <laughs> 200 kilo is easy, I can do it after, like, in the middle of a workout or after a training uh, with little to no warm up or after a lot of posture chin work, so no. But for years, this foreplay deadlift was very intimidating, like a huge plateau. Like I, I would, I, I would hunt myself and psych myself so much, and I could not even budge the barbell from the floor. Like on the deadlift, I'm weak off the floor. Like if I if I start to get it up, I know I got it. I will lock it out. I, it will pass the, the knee, no problem. Um, and yeah, it would it would scare me. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's that. Okay, Tommy Mayer, excuse me, Soviak, on NH video regarding Luke Maxine, you commented that you had tried turning your jawline and found success doing so. Yes. Could you please describe what your methodology was for jaw training? Did you use reps and set, train every day, perhaps equipment that you would recommend? I have decent natural physique, including the net, but I have weak jaw muscle and a lot of fat on the machine, even though I'm lean. Any advice would be appreciated. Thank you and keep training hard. Thank you, Tommy. Um, well, I made a entire article about that, about jaw training. I'm going to do the same in a video. Uh, just have to film it. Uh, but basically, I'm using jawliner uh, uh, devices, which is one of my sponsor. So they are doing chewing gums and specific gums that you put under your back teeth, the molar, I think you say in English, and you you clench your your your, your jaw and you squeeze and you hold and then you release and you squeeze and you hold and so on and so forth and you start doing that every other day for 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes and then progressively you will increase either the duration or the resistance of said gum and for the chewing gum uh, pretty much the same thing is uh, is recommended at first and then you experiment and as for me um, the gains were very very quick because in like two two months three months I like some stuff popped out here and at the same time I leaned out around my bone cheek here um, and also it seemed like my my whole face like was more just like square you know and I had two balls here and uh, my barber uh, like uh, got upset and mad at me because he was like oh I made you like the perfect beard line for your jaw and it was already pretty square and sharp. And now you have this, this thing and it's like I need to... <laughs> so he got mad at me because my job grew basically. And um, these days uh, I'm not training with a gum anymore. I'm just do using chewing gums. On the day I train I will basically choose that during my training sessions. Um, and I found that with that I maintain what I have with a jawline. And also it's like I, I lose fat here uh, near the, the nose right here. Um, so it gives me more, flat, uh, more of a flat face look in a sense, but at the same time, I have stronger uh, face threats, especially like the nose and the eyebrow, so I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, for now I only do that. And also the thing is that by having a square, so large jaw, you will hide also a bit more your neck. So I had like um, 18, 19 inches neck. Um, at, at the base here, and like, uh, I don't know, 17 inches right there, no? And it's like my neck was not as big anymore. Of course, if like your face is bigger, the neck does not look as good and as big as uh, as before. And to get back to that 
to the look I had prior to that. Um, I had to glue my neck to um, here it's 29 inches and here it's uh, 19. So currently right now it might not be that because I, I slacked a bit on the neck training. There are some exercises because I changed gym I couldn't really do as, uh, uh, as hard. But yeah, you have to also take that in account. I'm telling you this because you asked this question on the neck, um, uh, neck training guide and also because you said you are training it, so, you know, just be mindful of that. Okay, DT asks, how did you build your wings, what, which exercise and how much volume did you use? Does the appearance of your lats also have something to do with your lat insertion or can anyone get similar looking lats? Um, so the look of someone's muscle, whatever the muscle is, is purely genetic and it's about the insertion in the orientation and the length of the, of the bone. So if my lats are looking like that, it is because I have my own rib cage and my own lat insertion, which are quite low. Um, quite low, but on the iliac bone, but quite high on the vertebrae. So I have both low lat insertion, but also the Christmas tree, because you can see my low back fascia. Um, what exercise and how much volume did you use? Yet again, why are you asking me all about the volume? and not the strength or the um, exercise focus that I had because on volume I did 60 sets a week for my upper back and I also did just 10 sets depend of the period, depend of the context depend of what I was trying to prioritize which exercise? Uh, weighted pull up, T-bar, barbell row, machine row, cable row deadlift, partial deadlift, deficit deadlift, back extension and <laughs> I, can basic I did basically them all so just focus the basic, get strong on them, use clean form, do not get uh, hurt, and uh, just be patient. That's basically how you build your wings. But if there would be like one exercise to prioritize if you want to build your back, that would be the pull-up of a chin-up. Whatever variation, whatever you're doing, pull-down, pull-up, pull weighted pull-up, weight grip, close grip, whatever. Just pull yourself up. This is like the staple for back exercise, and then after that there is a deadlift, deadlift variation. Um, and then the rows come a bit after, but they are basically your big three for, for back. Rows, pull up, deadlift. And get strong, it's not about the volume. Ayin Mohamedi, Mohamedi, sorry, do you do weighted ab exercise or just body weight? Thanks, love the videos, thank you bro. Um, currently, I do not do weighted ab exercise, I just do body weight. Uh, I basically do one of the routines that is outlined in the a waist training guy ebooks so you can check it out if you want and I have tried a weighted up exercise and it's funny and you know I'm not funny but it's fun and uh, I did them I was doing like toes to bar with ankle weights for reps and I was also doing a roll um, uh, on my knees and also on my feet with weights on my back and um, I would get huge brick like chunky abs and I didn't like that so that's why I stopped and um, I did not see any real benefit on my belt rest compound training so yeah Jakub Brasht asks why are pull up better than pull down hmm. better for what uh, um, is that just more simple, I guess, for people to get inside the training? Um, and you can add weight, so the load potential is quite high, but they are not necessarily better than pull down. It depends again of what you're doing and who you are and what are the goals. Like, if you do not care about your pull ups number and you just want to have like the best exercise for uh, recruiting your lats, for example, um, supinated stand on pull down would be better for you. <clears throat> if you're very very big and you struggle with pull-up progression, pull-down are going to be one of the best tools you can to actually adapt and rotate to get more vertical pulling strength. So um, I don't see how they are better, it just depends yet again. Alex asks, are fat grips alone enough for forearms? Um, you tell me. Are you using fat grips and are, are you okay with your forearms? If yes, then yes. If no, then no. 
I'm, I, I'm sorry, some of this question is so con context specific. I'm not trying to be mean or, or anything, but some of your questions are just so context specific that I cannot answer. There are some people that never use any fat grips in their entire life. My father has one of the meatiest forearms that I've ever seen on a man. He never used fat grip. He used some sponge, you know, when he was training, when he was very, very young, like 20 or something, to not just hurt his hand because he was already doing labor jobs, so his hands were already completely trash from um, grabbing stuff that are hurting your hands, right? So he was using like sponge on, on his bar and stuff. Um, that didn't keep him from having huge forearm. And I see some people start using fat grips everywhere. They are very lean and defined and uh, muscular forearm, but they are thin. And some people have huge grip, like they have vice grip strength, and they have tiny forearm. And some people have huge chunky forearm, and they have some grip, but you know, it's not that high as you would potentially think when you see the forearm. And also the forearm, is there is the brachioradialis here, which is a elbow flexor, but there is also the other main uh, mass uh, attribute of the forearm are the wrist flexor, this one, this muscle that do that, right? Some people have huge wrist flexors and a weak brachioradialis, and some other people have completely flat and underdeveloped wrist flexors and a huge brachioradialis. So, yet again, it depends, you know? So, that's why I can't really answer you when you just give me that, you know? Okay, Baki, ask me thoughts on rib cage expansion with correct pullover form on its effectiveness with and without 20 rep squats. Thanks, man. Thank you for your question. Um, so, to be very brief, yes, rib cage expansion is real. Yes, you can do it. Yes, it is possible. Yes, pullover might be the best exercise to do it, but it is very, 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 very long. Except if you are a teenager. Why is it very long? Because we are talking about stretching and pulling on cartilage attachment and joint attachment on the sternum at two specific angles. Right here, which is called the Louis angle, and right there, which is, uh, I think, like the fifth or sixth rib cage attachment. This is where the, the uh, head of the ribs are the most pulled and can be the most stretched out. If you stretch out on the bone and on the cartilage, it will grow back thicker and a bit bigger, right? And if you stretch on it on the, in a very vertical fashion, you are forcing the rib cage to go up and out like that. So you can both increase the rib cage um, opening angle, which is what I personally did, and you can, if you do it hard enough, uh, frequent enough, you can also expand on the Louis angle here. So it's like a rib cage can go a bit protruding forward. And if it goes forward, everything will go forward as well. But it takes years, years and years and years. And about the uh, breathing squat with and without, it's not required. But the, the combo, why is it uh, uh, an old school staple combo? It is because with a rib cage, um, sorry, with a pullover, you're stretching your rib cage, you're forcing some thoracic extension, so it's like you will stack. You will, uh, you will be more upright like that, you will stick out your rib cage further. So it's like, if I'm sitting like that, you're like, okay, the guy is muscular, but you know, if I'm like that, you're like, whoa, yes, some mass, right? Um, and the, rib, the pullover will also build your lats, which make you look, you know, more like that. It will build your serratus here, so it will look thicker from the, from the, the front and the side. And it will also build quite a good amount of uh, chest muscle, especially the pec minor, because we will stretch it, so it will get thicker here. So it's like you're, you're going like that, okay? And you add squats. What squats are doing? Squats must be one of the best muscle building movement ever, it's like you're putting meats and meats on your lower body, but you're also conditioning your, your upper body for more weights, okay? And with a breathing squat, the technique is not just to do squats, you know, and then we, when you can't really go down, you're like, and then you go down again and you crank on a rape and so on and so forth. Real briefing squat method is having a barbell with squashing you and you're like, <gasps> like this. You take a huge, huge breath in and you shrug at the same time. So you're basically doing your traps and your upper back and even your arms. Sometimes you get a pump in your biceps and you're really going as up and wide as you can with a rib cage while having something squashing you. And this resistance will force your intercostal muscles, so the little muscles um, that are helping you breathe between your ribs, 
this one will grow also a bit thicker. Of course, these muscles are very thin, they are very small, it's not like they can go expensively huge, but there is still some tiny growth potential. And one undertaker store, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's like you can add a bit of this, you know. And if you do this um, early on in your life, then when it will solidify and be purely, literally, literally just bone, like, just bone, like, very little tendon and cartilage, um, it will stay. That's why so many guys um, had a thick rib cage in the golden and silver era. I'm pretty sure it was also one of the um, judge factor, you know, to point people, like, the thickest your rib cage are, the more the, the, the chest and the lats and upper back would stick out, just because the rib cage under all the muscle is also thicker. But I think it's also um, because they were training a bit differently than today. Today, no one is doing ribcage expansion. They are just doing chest and back, upper back and lats, and that's that. But uh, to get back to your question, um, my thought is that it exists, it is possible, and if you want to do it, well, just do it, you know. Commit to it, and not, not like um, one month, to say, oh, I'm going to do one month and see what happens. No, no, you go to three to six months, bro. Six, three to six months. That's the minimum uh, average time you need to go to see any kind of changes with any kind of joint or tendon or cartilage um, in nature, basically. Thickness and everything. So there you go. Okay, Tom Beans, ask me, have you ever done or wanted to do BGG? No. I never did it. I did some martial art, I did some wrestling on the ground, I did some stuff that could be apparent to BGG, but I didn't do BGG. If so or not, please explain your experience, I would love to know. I'm a blue belt and I've taken up lifting to put on some more size and your channel has really helped. Thank you tremendously. Thank you, Tom. So as I said, I never did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I have some wrestling on the ground and like, um, uh, I forgot the name uh, because I did some martial arts so I, I remember there is a specific name, you know, about doing stuff like um, on your knees and submitting or locking the the opponent but I didn't do BGG. What I did was called Nihon Tai Jitsu. So I know there is some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu component inside but I didn't do uh, this specifically and as for what I think about it uh, it's good, but it's not like the best martial art there is, and I think people, if they want to learn to defend themselves, should better learn about striking and blocking and parrying and evading stuff, rather than um, learning how to fight on the ground, because in most street fights, if you go on the ground, you're dead. So, yeah. Uh, Andreas Axelsen asked me, oh, it's French, uh, so he asked me about intensification technique for chest muscle. Uh, I don't do uh, intensification technique and there is nothing special about chest regarding the intensification technique. Uh, I'd say, I'd wager that rest pose might be one of the... Um, it might be one of the best one to do, but I don't do this kind of stuff, so yeah. Um, Axel Benoit, ask me, have you ever sustained an injury because of lifting and how do you approach it with your training? Yes, many times. Um, I've had tendino paddies, I've had um, low back strains, I've had uh, knee tendinitis, elbow, wrist, shoulder, I've had muscle strains, I've had muscle cramps. And uh, how do you approach it with your training? Uh, well, I make do my best to let it heal and I wait it out and if it needs some help I help it basically uh, and also I check with a physiotherapist or a doctor if it's really bad leaves of autumn oh that's a nice name what is that garment you're wearing it is a mule knee it is like torf hammer That's why I'm so strong, it's because of this. Cubase asks, have I heard of a few people say that bodyweight exercises are easier to recover from or that don't generate as much fatigue as free weight movement? Is it just a urban legend or there is some truth to it? 
Um, yes, it's true. By the way, just subscribe it after seeing NH video about you. Thank you, bro. Welcome. I must say, I'm really impressed by your training and results. Looking forward to watch some of your videos. Thank you, bro. So yes, it is. It's not a urban legend. It's pretty true. Um, why? Because the in, like, if you do push-ups, you're basically moving half of your body weight. So let's say you're 80 kilo of body weight, or 175 pounds. You're moving 40 kilo. Okay, you can do thousands and thousands of reps with that. You can have result, great result with that. But is it high intensity? Is it really really hard on the joint and on the body? No. If it were, if it were, you would not be able to crank out so much, both in frequency and in volume. Same thing for body weight squats. Same thing for pull up. Same thing for invented row. Same thing for many 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 body weight exercises. So that's why they are so good. To fill in a training session as a finisher or um, uh, when, you're, you, when you just want to keep moving your body but you don't want to destroy uh, your joint and like your training result, you do it at the end, you do dips or whatever. That's why when you're stuck at home or whatever, if you do a very very high volume of it, uh, you're basically maintaining a lot of body mass but you're also doing some GPP. That's why uh, there are so much use in GPP. Um, and as for the generate as much fatigue as free weight movement, um, I can take again the same example. You have your push up at body weight and then you have bench press with tea plate. What is going to fatigue you the most? What is going to be the hardest on your body? It's going to be the tea plate bench presses, except if you are very, 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 very big and heavy for your push ups. It's not that push ups are worse than bench press, it's just that in terms of fatigue ratio, bench press or any kind of loaded exercise will be much harder on your body overall as purely merely body weight movement. So there you go. Francis asked me, will you ever compete in powerlifting? What are your best bench, squat and deadlift? So no, I don't think I will ever compete in powerlifting. I'm, I have no interest in that. So it's, it's not that I don't like it, but it just doesn't interest me. What are my best bench, squat and deadlift? Um, my best bench is three plate <coughs> reverse grip. Um, my best squat, before all my knee problems, because now I'm very very careful with that. Um, I think it was four plate eighty g, and I was seventy seven kilograms, so it's like two point five, more or less, the two point three I think body weight squat ratio. Um, for the for the bench press, I was 83 kilos, so a little less than two times my body weight. Uh, and deadlift from the floor, as I said, I've done uh, four plate and a half many times, 200 kilos, but I never did go above that. But I would say it's between five plate and five plate and a half, but I never tested out. So there you go, bro. Nothing half shattering, just advanced numbers. Um, Michael. Schaefer asked me, when deciding to go for a lift, a bit easier within the bodybuilding program, how do you decide when and what? For instance, you, you're heavy by 5 weighted pull-up. Why did you decide to go for that heavy stuff and not a lighter 4 by 8 And would you recommend something like this at all to someone who doesn't have their recovery fully in check? Cheers, appreciate the work. Thank you, Michael. Good question. Um, how do I decide when and what? Uh, simple. If it's a compound movement, I know I can go pretty heavy on that. If it's a movement that never or very, very few times gave me problem, I know I can go very heavy on that. And um, if it's isolation or if it's a movement that has been tricky for me, I do not do it as heavy or I do heavy but as a second or third movement in my session. That way I'm already warmed up and I know that I will not be able to push that far with that movement. Um, and the difference between, let's just say, a 5x5 five five and a 4x8 First, there is volume, there is little less volume. 4x8 is 32 reps, 5x5 five five is uh, 25 reps. So, slightly less volume. And a 4x8 for me is much more aligned with doing assistance work, high isolation work. Um, well, dr volume is also one of the driving factors, not just purely mechanical tension, uh, and also where joint um, status would be a question. like. Can my joint actually take the load? Can my joint withstand that? Okay, and most of the time it's of course on isolation exercise that you ask yourself this question. 
And would I recommend that for someone who does not have a recovery fully in check? No. You always play the safe card. Bodybuilding is not a sprint, it's a marathon. The guy who wins is the guy who can do this for 10 to 15 years, year in, year out. Not the guy who is fully committed to it and busting, um, busting his ass at the gym for like 8 months. Okay? So, thank you bro for your question. Next question. Arda ask how did your food intake over years look like quantity quality wise do you think at a certain level you can maintain a lean and fairly muscular physique eating whatever you want if so how long do you think the process would take to get to that level of average or how was it like for you good question bro um, um my food intake went from 3000 calories up to 6000 kilocalories and now down to about 4k and a half also Quantity quality wise, uh, it's, it has always been pretty much the same quality. Uh, I, I go organic when I can, I go free range or local uh, on pretty much everything. Um, and then for the eating whatever you want, it depends on your metabolism um, efficiency. Um, because, and also the frequency about what is the frequency and the quantity of eating whatever you want. Like some guys maintain a very, very good physique eating dessert every day, uh, or mostly every day. One guy is can have a cheat meal every week and have no problem with that. It depends. It depends on how hard you're training and how fast can you burn this excess of these different type of calories. But it also depends on your gut uh, system. If you have a good, good gut system that can um, take the load of that uh, endotoxin and new stuff that can potentially be harmful and uh, and bad for you, no problem. If you can't, you will have some problem. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. But I would say that you would need to have at least five years of training in a very solid body before trying these kind of things. So, yeah, like everything. Uh, everything is poison, nothing is poison, what makes the poison is the dosage, as Hippocrates said. Sight asks, how do you keep your elbows healthy? Um, I don't do movements that hurts. I strengthen them via triceps isolation and forearm isolation. And uh, I use elbow sleeves on my uh, heavy precious compounds now. Uh, it really made a difference. Um, Jake O.P. has two questions. First, tips to deal with knee pains. Um, find what is hurting, stop doing it, or do it better, or reduce the weight, whatever, and strengthen everything around the knee. So tibialis muscle, uh, calves, hamstring, VMO uh, for the quads. You can also massage. You will see there are some muscle knots and like a trigger point, most, most likely. And then um, you slightly add in more and more exercise that can be stressful on the knee and you check how you're re reacting to them basically. And the second question is, do you do GPP? No, I don't. I'm pretty active and I train very frequently, very hard. But uh, at least once a week, I will do high rep of bend curl, bend uh, triceps extension uh, and some stuff from my knee and my ankle, literally calves and, um, and uh, like quad and hamstring work. Shirtless Viking asks, how can I program to grow my lats, delt, triceps and forearm the most with legs in next year with traps? <laughs> um, I'm sorry bro, I don't do like programs like that. Um, like I'm a personal trainer, so you basically have to pay me to, for this kind of thing. And But how can you program to grow your lats? But well, train them for delt the same, triceps and forearm the same. Uh, you can do weighted chin-ups, you can do a heavy overhead press. Uh, for legs, you can do whatever, squat, speed squat, uh, deadlift. For deadlift, you have results of the traps, so it works, and yeah. Unwashed towel Ask, have you ever experienced any injuries, and if so, how did you go about recovering from them? Yeah, I've experienced many injuries. Most of the time, it's about resting um, and doing active rest and then prehabbing the zone. For example, I had some very sharp tendonitis on this, uh, this wrist after some cheat curl on the st um, an easy bar, but it wasn't the same angle, so my wrist 
basically he told me to F me. Um, and I rehab it, rehabbed it by doing rotation with a very light, little 2.5 kilo plate and doing this kind of movement, like basically training my forearm. And then I doing wrist curl, wrist extension uh, with the um, Andrieu um, bobin. Uh, I think you call that a wrist roller in English. Uh, and that's that. That's pretty much it, you know. Like with any injuries, you let it rest, you assess what's the problem, you see what's painful, what is not, and you make your best effort to still train the area to help it recover.